so our next destination was Canyonlands National Park. And to get there from Hanksville, we drove up desolate Route 24 through a pretty dry, barren desert to get to Interstate 70 that runs east-west through southern Utah. And then you take 70 east and then go down south on Route 191 to Moab, where both Arches National Park and Canyonlands National Park are located. And I wanted to stop at Green River en route. I wanted to take a look at their train station, one of four Amtrak train stations in Utah. And this one, they had just done some work to put in a new concrete platform and a handicapped accessible ramp. So this is looking east towards Colorado. This is the first stop in Utah from Colorado. The next stop is Grand Junction, Colorado. And this is looking west and there's still a construction gate, so they were still finishing up this project, but it looks nice. They did a nice job. And this is an old station house. I don't know if they're going to convert this back to an active station house to give people a waiting area, but that's there. And when we were there, there was just one small paved area for handicap parking and everything else was gravel. I don't know if they're going to pave the whole area. But to get there, it was pretty rough coming from what amounts to the downtown of Green River, Utah. So you had to go across these rough tracks. But in Green River, there's a different old buildings that are kind of standalone which is a unique look like there are a lot of used to be other buildings maybe in between the individual buildings that we saw and now there's just a few older buildings still standing and this is the former frank's pizza which doesn't look like it's been open for a long time and this is a attractive older building that does seem to be in use and this is an old bank building, and there's a sign on the window for T-shirts, but I don't know if that's still a going thing. But that's what I always envision as the West, an old bank building look like this. So also in Green River, there's a couple of dilapidated motels. This was one of them with the roof sort of caved in in the middle, no longer operating. And the other end of the motel, they used to have a restaurant and everything. Just cars parked there. I don't know what they're doing there. But anyway, there is a place to stay in Green River. If you took the train and whatever, for whatever reason, you needed to stay overnight. It's kind of off in the middle of nowhere. It's only a town of a population of about 865. It used to be a little bit more than a thousand, so it's decreased since then. But it does have the Green River that flows through it. And I noticed to the south of town on the map, there's a place called Crystal Geyser. That would have been interesting to see. I think you could only get there by dirt roads. So back to the train station. This is the California Zephyr train that comes through the train, comes through the station, and it runs all the way from Chicago to the San Francisco Bay Area. So it's a premium transcontinental train, it takes two days to get from Chicago to San Francisco. And when it comes through Green River, there, as I mentioned, there are four train stations in Utah and the times that it arrives in Green River aren't bad, especially if you compare it to, say, Salt Lake City to the north, 
which is three stations up. But going west, it stops around 6 p.m. And going east towards Colorado and then on to Chicago, it arrives at 8 a.m. Now, that's if it's on time. And they, Amtrak website will point out what their on-time performance is. They don't try to hide it. And on this long two-day trip, their on-time performance is only 37.6%, which they attribute a lot to having to operate passenger trains on private freight railroads that don't always give them the right of way. But it's a long two-day trip. A lot of things can cause a train to be running late. So, But if you did take the train to Green River, you'd be about a hour, a little less, to Moab. And they do have Uber and Lyft, so you could take that. And it's not cheap. I think per car it's like $125 to $175. And if you could split that between several people, that would lower the cost. But it is nice that this area, that it is possible if you can get the Uber or Lyft to come when you get there. They also have, they've had shuttle buses. I don't know if they still do, but uh, such an option would then bring you from the train down to Moab. And then you could rent a car in Moab or just get around by hiking or biking or going on excursions or hiring a, a jeep to take you around there it is nice that there's another way to get to these national parks other than just driving your own car or your own rental car so they don't have any rental cars in green river it's too small of a place but the train tracks i've noticed actually did go down all the way to moab so maybe someday utah will maybe help subsidize a train that would take people all the way down from the salt lake city area down to moab which is very popular so this is canyonlands and i took this picture from a little key card holder from our hotel that we stayed at, the Radcliffe Moab, just because I thought it was the best picture I could find of the overall area, which is just spectacular. And when you get to the visitor center in the island in the sky section of the park, which is the park we went to, it's a the park is like three different areas. There's the island in the sky, which is kind of a high plateau where you look down over the canyons below just spectacular and then the needles is in the southeast where there's a i think there's a small row that goes in and maybe a visitor center there in the needles with some really interesting geology and arches there aren't just arches in arches national park there's also ones in elsewhere including in canyonlands national park and then the most remote part of the park is the southwestern part on the opposite side of the Colorado River, which is called the Maze, and it's just a labyrinth of canyons and side canyons and not too much in the way of even dirt roads to get in there. So it's really wild wilderness. And you can sort of see on the map, there's two rivers at play here. The Green River is the one that comes down from Green River and it flows into the Colorado River, which is cutting in from the northeast, heading southwest. So it's one river that's kind of calm, flowing into another river that can be rampaging and a wild river, the Colorado River. So that's the layout of Canyonlands. And then we drove in. To the island and sky and got off at a couple of different scenic overlooks just to take in the view which was just fantastic and in this picture you can sort of see a road way down below and i'll talk about that more 
So this, I just want to give you a brief look at the other areas, the needles, which has trails and a row that does come in. They do have a visitor center. And that's some of the typical geology you'll see in the needles and why it's named the way it is. And then the maze, which is an intriguing area just because it's so hard to get into and remote. And there's a shot of the maze, just amazing, all the canyons. It would be a maze if you hiked in there. Better bring plenty of water and let the park know that you're hiking in and when you expect to be returning. So we stopped at the Island of the Sky Visitor Center. I asked my wife to take a picture by the sign, but she stood in front of the sign. But here's the sign. And outside the Visitor Center, they encourage you to take a hike. And they have various short hikes you can take and longer hikes. We did a little short hiking at a couple of the scenic, scenic overlook areas. And again, here's the a close-up of the geology of the area, the topography. And as I mentioned, we were high up and we'd be looking down at these canyons. And the direction we were looking in was mostly towards the Colorado River flowing in from the east. So here we are at our first pull-off area and my wife is standing on they call it slick rock which can be very slippery when it's wet but it's also you got to be mindful it's sandy and it can be slippery even when it's dry and there's that road again and then to get to that road way down below you'll see right on the left it cuts down the start of the road comes from the level we're at and drives down and I'll show you more pictures of that which are something and looking up at the uh, slick rock and we wanted to get as close as we could without getting too close to the edge because it's a long way down into the canyon and there's another unbelievable view and again with that road that sort of wraps around the side of the canyon it's an old mining road that is now available for visitors to use using four-wheel drive vehicles and you'll note there's no guardrails along the sides of this road and that's a long drop down. So we thought the road coming out of Zion National Park, which was a paved state highway, was something. But this is a whole other level. So there were occasional cars driving down this road. This was one, and it was driving very slowly to make sure you're not going to make any mistakes. There's no room for mistakes. I would be driving just as slowly if I was on this road, if I was out of my mind driving this road. And this was an occasion where two cars were going in the opposite direction. It is a two-way road. And they both didn't want to drive on the inside part next to the edge of the canyon. And they kind of stood and faced each other for a while. And finally, the car going to the right won out, even though it was on the left it still stayed closest to the edge and the van drove around it and there's just another shot of that road way down below and a close-up and we did see cars that had made it down to that level and then when you get down to this level you have to somehow take another road to get down to you can see in the distance of the road continues even further down just goes down and down and down what a road and i'll have to look for a youtube video myself of anybody who's driven this road it's just fascinating 
and gutsy. And we're always focused on the road. We're looking at the overall scenery, but just this road driving along the edge of the canyon. So at another scenic overlook, we stopped and I walked out a little bit. I'll show in an upcoming video clip. And they had a couple of informational signs. One was about dropping into the canyon. And that is something I would not want to do. And you had to get kind of close to the edge to read this sign. So you were risking dropping yourself into the canyon. And they had another sign about the anatomy of a canyon. Just there's so much to read and learn about. So I like to take pictures of things and read about it later. But the thing we kept focusing on was that road and look how it winds down. Just amazing. So let me show you some clips of Canyonlands. This is our introduction to Canyonlands National Park. Beautiful. My wife is walking down the Slick Rock. So we'll take a look at this park from different viewpoints. Maybe do one or two short hikes. Very sandy here. Gonna watch this car van go around this curve. Unbelievable. I thought we were on some gutsy roads. We were, honey. This is the ultimate uh, death-defying road. Here we are at another viewpoint. My wife went up ahead and see where she is. Just down the road a little bit from the visitor center. the hat down 3,000 feet. That road again. You know, nothing doing when you get down to that level, then you have to get down to a further level I know. There's some cars way in the distance. Bear with me as I mosey over a little bit this way. My wife is trying to get some semblance of a tan. We're both very pale. Heart rate. 
You haven't seen anybody on that road in a while. I still want to see if they have a warning sign before you go on that road, because, boy, that road is not for beginners. So I'm just scouting this out to see if my wife might want to walk out here. Let's see. So far, so good. Pretty flat, not too close to the edge, which is key. Yeah, very doable. I'll walk out here and then I'll come back and see if she wants to do it too. It's not just the worry about falling over the edge, it's more like dropping something. And if it goes over the edge, it's gone. Well, even if my wife doesn't come out here, she'll be proud of me that I came out here. We both were saying, we're, like, getting more afraid of heights as we get older. Mm -hmm. like There's that crazy road that goes down. study that I always imagine that some of these are like little amphitheaters these little semicircular canyons when I went down the Colorado River when I was in high school on a rafting trip we would look up and we'd see these huge canyons, walls, that would be like semi-circular. And I would always imagine that they'd be like football stadiums that could hold a million people. They were just gigantic. Dropping into the canyon. Well, that's something I don't want to do, but I'll take a picture of this sign and read it later. All right, then you can walk up on that rock, I guess, if you want. Not me. More road action, people driving down into the canyon. <laughs> and nobody wants to be on the uh, canyon side of the road. It's a two-way road. be in any hurry on this road <clears throat> or feel like you're being rushed by somebody behind you that actually will go faster so looks like the one car is letting the other one go by <laughs> I would do the same with me it would be the race of tortoises And my knuckles would be white, holding onto that steering wheel. Alright, I'm going to take a look at the sign and go back and see if my wife wants to come out here.